I travel quite a bit for my job, and most of the time I drive myself. It takes me all over the country, and typically I enjoy it quite a lot. I've also had some interesting experiences though. One of those happened two years ago now. I was driving home still a good distance away. I was somewhere in Arkansas, I believe, seemingly in the middle of nowhere for some reason. I remember I was not on the highway, but I was on a quieter road. I don't quite recall if there had been some construction or a detour or if I took a wrong turn or what, but on both sides of this road was just grass and trees, occasionally a big patch of woods as well. I remember that my signal went out on my phone. Obviously, I was following the directions on it, but they went away as soon as my phone signal did. Nothing would load, and I just had to hope I was traveling in the right direction. It very quickly started to become later and later at night. I hadn't booked a hotel yet, but I had been planning to do so when I stopped for gas. Eventually, I remember my car made a noise, and I realized I was running very low on fuel. Meanwhile, I still had no service. The last thing I wanted to do was be stranded out here with no signal and no fuel and no way to get help. I decided I would take the next exit and hope there was a gas station up ahead somewhere. About a mile later, I saw a road on the right that looked promising. I turned down it and started driving. Soon, I did see a sign for a gas station, but it was down yet another road. The sign said it was about four miles down that way. It seemed pretty far, but I could still make it, so I drove the four miles. I soon arrived at said gas station, and when I got there, I saw it was certainly in the middle of nowhere. There were trees and wildlands all around it, but other than that, there were no businesses or buildings or cars or anything nearby. I parked next to one of the gas pumps and checked my phone. Still no service. I looked over to the convenience store connected to the small gas station, but it was closed. Luckily, the pumps were still open though, it seemed. I got out of my car and I was kind of amazed at how crazy quiet it was. I started fueling my vehicle and I peeked around a bit further. There were no other cars driving by, no vehicles parked anywhere. When I was looking around, I looked into the direction of the small convenience store building, only to see that there was a man standing behind it on the side. He appeared to be trying to hide, and he was peeking right at me. I was wondering who this man could possibly be, and what he was doing here with no vehicles in sight. It was really sketchy. I couldn't figure out that many details about the man because of how dark it was and how far away he was from me. I looked away and tried to keep my mind off it by looking elsewhere, but I just had a really bad feeling about this guy. I thought about just shutting off the gas even though the tank wasn't full yet. However, I was in the middle of nowhere and I knew I might need a lot of fuel to get where I needed to go. I let it continue to run and looked back over in the direction of this suspicious man. He was still there hiding and still looking at me in this creepy way. It was unsettling to say the least. When my gas tank was full, I started to take the pump out and noticed the man had disappeared behind the building. I was glad that he was out of my sight and also wondered what he was doing. I got inside my car breathing a sigh of relief. I then started the engine and checked my phone yet again for service. I still had nothing. I was about to drive away when I noticed a car driving around from behind the gas station. I don't even think that car had been on the road. I'm pretty sure it was parked behind the building, which was just all dirt. I realized that it was likely the man who had been watching me. I started to drive away and saw the headlights of the car behind me follow. Now, I was once again really creeped out. Whoever this guy was was surely tailing me. He had his brights on, so I couldn't tell any of the details of what he looked like. I moved over to the side of the road, hoping he would pass me by, but he stayed right on me. 
I didn't know what to do. It's not like I could drive down to a police station because I didn't know where any of them were in the area. I also didn't have any service on my phone to look it up. At least I had a full tank of gas though. I would have to just drive and hope to find a place I could go to or lose the tailing of this car behind me. I drove back towards the highway I had previously been on earlier in the day, but after going straight for a while, I panicked and turned. I drove down this street a little ways and turned again. I really had no idea where I was going. I just kind of felt like if I turned a lot, maybe the guy behind me would get tired of following me, or maybe he'd get lost. He didn't seem to, though, and remained right on my tail. Eventually, I turned down something that led to a slightly larger and busier road. However, nobody else was out at the time. I didn't see a single other vehicle. The guy remained right behind me as I drove down this road for a while. I turned again and again at just about every single opportunity. After turning randomly for probably 15 or more minutes, I decided to just go straight for a while. I didn't know where I was, but I was honestly tired of turning and driving down mystery streets. All of a sudden, the car behind me just turned onto a random road. I had to look twice. I couldn't even believe my eyes, but they were finally gone. I kept driving and turned down another road, just in case the car changed its mind. From there, I checked my phone again, but still no service. I decided to keep driving down this road until I got signal again. It took me almost an hour, but finally I had some coverage. I first looked up directions to a nearby town. I then found a hotel room and called the police to report the whole situation. I'm not sure if the man was ever located. I'm not sure how they would, really. I still wonder who he was and what he was trying to do. I'm just really glad I made it out of there. Back when I was a sophomore in high school, I used to be very close friends with this girl, Kay. Kay and I met in middle school, and we instantly clicked. We would hang out after school very frequently. Kay had a very turbulent childhood. Deceased father, foster care, substance abuse mom, and Kay's family would house up a lot. Our sophomore year, Kay's family was staying with their step-aunt's ex-husband. My parents never really stressed out about me hanging out with Kay because she was such a kind soul and a great influence on me. Now, the man Kay was staying with at the time was interesting to say the least. I remember the first incident that made me really scratch my head was when we all went out to dinner with Kay and her family. Richard tagged along. Kay and I were sat at the table with him and he was venting to us about his dating life and showing us pictures of his Tinder bio. He talked about all the women he was chatting to. We both kind of laughed it off and engaged with him, but we didn't really think too much of it. Sometimes when Kay and I hung out, Richard would have us come to the basement. He had this room with a drum kit down there and he'd play them for us with the lights off. Anyway, the strangest encounter I personally had with him was when I went to Kay's house to hang out one day. She went to take a shower, and while she was in the shower, I was sitting down in her room. Richard wandered in and told me he wanted to show me something cool in his room. Kay's room was on the first floor, and Richard's was the only room up on the second floor. Being the naive girl I was at the time, I agreed and followed him up the stairs. When we got to his room, he realized that his room was locked and seemed to get very annoyed and jittery. He left his key downstairs. Now, instead of going downstairs, Richard took out his credit card from his wallet and tried to unlock the door that way. Thankfully, it didn't work. Something clicked in my brain in that moment, and I decided to go back downstairs and sit in the bathroom with Kay until she was done with her shower. I'm 23 now, and looking back on it, I don't think there was any cool thing to show me in that room. 
I thanked the moon and the stars that he didn't manage to get it unlocked. I never told Kay about the incident, but as we started to get older, I casually asked if she'd ever had any strange encounters with him herself. She said no. I'm not really sure how to end this, but I'm thankful I didn't get to see what was beyond that door. Back in the year 2000, when I was 11, my mother, my brother, and myself flew from West London to Perth, Australia to spend five straight weeks there for my uncle's wedding. My uncle's place was practically a palace almost. He lived in this gated community with several security guards patrolling the area, he even had one of those pin drop sensitive alarm systems. On the fourth day of our visit there, all the adults went out for a party. My brother James, who was 13, and myself were going to be left all alone in my uncle's place for a while. Given that the place was as secure as Fort Knox, though, no one was very concerned about us being on our own. Our mother promised to be back by 1am and left us our mobile number. They set the alarm and then left. Afterwards, James and I just kind of wandered around the house for a while. It almost felt like we were in a museum or something. Every door and window we found was closed and locked. Eventually, we went back to the living room and began to watch a movie. We had the volume set pretty high because we wanted to take advantage of my uncle's surround sound. About 30 minutes in... James paused the movie and tilted his head sideways, as if he was listening in to something. After a few seconds, he shrugged and resumed the movie. Less than five minutes after that, he paused again and looked towards the foyer. James and I were in the living room, and the wall that separated us from the foyer had this rectangular decorative opening with cast iron bars inside it. Beyond the opening was just a bunch of darkness. There weren't any lights on in the front of the house. I asked what he was doing, and he quickly shushed me. He sat there in silence for a few moments, then slowly seemed to relax and settled back into his seat. We resumed the movie. About 15 minutes later is when I began to hear it as well. There was footsteps coming from the front of the house. It sounded like heavy boots on marble, and for us to be able to hear it over the surround sound... Whoever was there was certainly not trying to be quiet. Surprisingly, neither of us freaked out. We didn't even pause the movie again. My brother just picked up the landline and called my mom's number. We both stared out into the dark foyer, waiting for someone to peek their head around that decorative window and peer in at us. My brother had to call a few times before my mom finally answered. He stated, much more calmly than I could have ever managed, that he was sure someone was in the house with us. My mother instructed him to hit the panic button on the security system and hide in one of the ground floor bedrooms. She stated she was on her way. I remember James and I looking at each other with apprehension. The panic alarm button was in the closet in the foyer, and that was where we had last heard the footsteps coming from. I cautiously stood up, feeling like I was detached from my own body almost, like it was a dream. I carefully wandered over to the hallway that led into the foyer. I didn't take another step when I noticed the motion sensor in the upper corner of the room. My uncle had these motion sensors in every room that would trip the alarm when no one was home. When we were there though, the motion sensors were still on, but they would not set off the alarm. They would, however, flash red whenever they detected movement in the area. From my peaking position, I could see the lights were flashing red. I was too far away for it to be sensing me. Someone was in there, and they were moving around. I backed up, and James immediately grabbed my hand. He must have seen the look on my face. He led me into the kitchen. Being the scared kids we were... Our first instinct was to hide away in the pantry. We were only there for a minute or so, because we realized just how stupid that was to try and hide there. 
we needed to get out of that house. We left the pantry and grabbed two knives from the knife block. What better way to make the situation even worse than by running in a panic out the back door into darkness while clutching massive knives? As soon as we opened the door in the kitchen, the alarm started blaring. I glanced back towards the decorative window and caught a glimpse of a man in a blue shirt peeking through it at us. James and I sprinted around the side of the house without even bothering to try and unlock the gate. James told me to slide my knife under the gate, and he did the same. We both jumped over it and ran across the street. I was half convinced the man would be right behind us, trying to catch us, but I didn't see him again. In fact, we didn't see anything else from inside the house until security arrived about a half minute later. By then, we were sitting on the curb on the opposite side of the street. We heard a loud thudding noise from the second floor. The security guards stood with us, and police arrived minutes later. Three of them ran inside the building, using the key the security guard provided to enter, and they swept the house. Our mother arrived and held us tight until the police had the alarm shut off. They exited the house and claimed that they'd found no one inside, but the master bedroom on the second floor had been completely ransacked. Furniture had been tossed across the room, which obviously hadn't been like that earlier. When my uncle arrived, he did a walkthrough of the home and sifted through the mess in his bedroom. He concluded there was nothing missing. James and I were terrified when we heard from the police there was no way the man could have gained entry while the alarm was on. It was much more likely that he had been in the house the entire time, laying low until after all the adults left. Since the intruder never came around our side of the house while we were escaping, they concluded he must have run out back and jumped the stone wall, escaping by running on foot down the freeway. One thing has never sat right with me all these years later. If that guy had been there to rob the place, he could have easily overpowered James and I while we were on the couch, or could have chased us down when we were running. I mean, he had to have known we were there when he came out of his hiding place. The surround sound from the movie was blaring. Obviously, he didn't want to be seen by us, but it also seems that he didn't try to hurt us. That made me suspect over the years that he must have been someone we both knew, though I didn't recognize him based on the glimpse I caught of him. I'm also not completely convinced that my uncle was telling the truth when he said that nothing was missing. Maybe my uncle knew who the man was the whole time, but didn't want to turn him in. I mean, that's just a theory, but otherwise, I have no idea why a complete stranger would lay low in our house and remain hidden from us, only to not chase us when he saw us there, and only ransack the bedroom before running away without stealing anything. I was driving alone from eastern Colorado to Wyoming in the middle of the night on a dirt road. It was the type of darkness that most people will never get to experience, like being stuck in the middle of the ocean, no cities or even small towns, for hundreds of miles in every direction. Once I hit the border of Wyoming, the road became pavement after about a half an hour. I heard this loud bang all of a sudden, and my car pulled hard to the middle of the road. I had a flat tire. I pulled over and got out. It was as quiet and as dark as it can possibly be. There was not a single light of any kind for hundreds of miles, except for the headlights of my car. I started changing my tire by myself, feeling extremely uneasy about being alone so in the middle of nowhere. I got my tools and my spare tire out of the trunk and started changing that flat as fast as I could. For some reason, I had the feeling I had to try my best to be quiet. It felt like every little sound I made was incredibly loud. I even turned my music off as well. I crouched down, finishing up tightening the lug nuts on the spare tire when I heard someone call out from right behind me. Hey there, need any help with that? 
I spun around and stood up fast. No one was there. I looked across the street to the other lane, and no one was there either. I grabbed my tire iron and started yelling into the darkness. Who's there? It was dead silence. I mean, I could hear my heart beating, but I could barely even see the other side of the road because of this extreme darkness. I knew there was nothing anywhere around me but dirt and sagebrush. I hurried and spun the jack down. The whole time I had the distinct feeling someone was right behind me in the darkness watching me. I quickly threw all the tools in the trunk with the flat. I could not jump back in my car fast enough. I felt that presence there in the darkness. I felt like someone was going to try and stop me from closing the door. I slammed it shut as fast as I could, and I sped home to Wyoming, freaked out the whole time. I kept checking my back seat over and over again. It was such a frightening experience, and I never even caught a glimpse of the person who was there that night. When I was younger, my family and I went on a road trip to Wyoming to see Yellowstone National Park. It's a real beautiful place, and if you've never seen it before, I would highly recommend it. From our home in California, it was about a 17-hour drive in our Yukon XL, which is the largest, most comfortable road trip SUV you can imagine. It took us several days worth of on and off driving to get there, and during nights we tried to find a little motel to rest at. On one of the nights, due to us being a bit behind schedule, my dad attempted to drive through the night to get us there sooner. He made it probably into the wee hours of the morning before he deemed it unsafe to go any further. He parked us in this unlit rest stop in the middle of the woods in some flyover state. My brothers and I had fallen asleep in the car several hours before he had stopped, so for the last couple of hours, so for at least a couple of hours, we were all sleeping in the car in this dark little parking lot surrounded by forest on all sides. Having a couple of hours of sleep now and being in a pretty uncomfortable position, I was woken up in the middle of the night. I was pretty disoriented, but not really scared per se. I looked around and saw everyone else fast asleep in the pitch black car. I naturally felt pretty alone in that moment. I tried to fall back to sleep, but for some reason it was just not working out. I just sat there for a while, boredom really setting in. I looked out the window to see where we were. It was pitch black outside, so I couldn't really see anything. Luckily, I was the type to pack a light on me. I had brought a couple of flashlights in my bag, so being careful not to disturb my sleeping family, I unzipped my bag and reached into it and pulled out a little plastic yellow flashlight. It wasn't the brightest around, but it was enough to see the foreground of the general surroundings. I put it up to the glass, making sure not to make any noise, and pushed the little switch into the on position. I pressed my face against the glass and looked out. At first, it looked like a normal tree line with some bushes and trees and whatever. As I scanned the darkness looking for animals and buildings, though, I noticed this distinct dark shape standing in between two trees in the distance. It looked clearly like the shape of a man, but it wasn't moving at all. It was just standing there. After watching it for a good while and seeing no real signs of movement, I just assumed it was a bush of some kind or some sort of natural occurrence. Just as I was about to turn the light off and reattempt sleep though, I saw that shadowy shape turn 90 degrees and hide behind a tree, disappearing from sight. That scared the hell out of me. I immediately turned off the flashlight and threw my sweater turned blanket over my head, shutting my eyes tightly and covering my ears. I was paralyzed with fear. I sat in this semi-fetal position, clutching my flashlight for the rest of the night. I waited until the sun came up and we were back on the road before I got any sleep. 
I didn't tell anyone about the man that I saw in the woods. I almost didn't believe he was real. So, I was the manager of a hotel when what I'm about to tell you occurred. It was around 1am and no new guests had arrived for a couple of hours. It was seeming like it was going to be a pretty slow night. I was talking to one of the employees about how whenever a night is this slow or quiet, something bad usually happens. They said I was just being superstitious, but I've since come to realize that that really is the truth. I've seen a lot during my 10 years as a manager. Plenty of domestic disturbances, fights in the hallways, drug deals gone wrong. The list really does go on and on, but that night had to have been the worst. At around 1.30 a.m., after my co-workers were finally finished telling me how ridiculous I was being about the quiet night, I got a call from one of the rooms. I answered and was met by the voice of what seemed like a little boy. He sounded like he was around five years old at most, and he started telling me that he really wanted his mommy, and I had to go get her. I asked the boy if he was alright, and he said yes, but that he just wanted his mommy. I started to get real concerned. Just as I was going to ask what room number he was in, a man came to the phone and identified himself as the boy's father. He apologized for his son wasting my time. Before I could even get a word in, the line just went dead. We were old school, so we couldn't even tell what room the boy had called from. I started to get worried, so I started asking around to my employees. Did any of them remember a man checking into a room with a little boy? I was having no luck until I asked our restaurant manager. He said a man had come in with a child earlier that night, and he had used a voucher we gave all our guests. Thankfully, it was the only voucher used that day, and it had the room number on it. I grabbed one of the largest men we had on staff and headed for the room right away. I had no intentions of confronting the man or really asking any questions even. I just wanted to check and make sure that boy was okay. I grabbed a few towels and told my employee to wait at the end of the hall. I knocked on the door, and a man answered. He was a short, chubby guy that smelled horribly of alcohol. Behind him on the bed was the little boy. He was so skinny I could see his ribs, and he was covered in bruises. I tried to act calm and told the man I had the towels he'd requested. He, of course, denied requesting any towels and shut the door in my face. I turned around and ran down the hall to the elevator. Once I was back at the front desk, I immediately called the police. I was instructed to act naturally and not make any further contact with the man to avoid him running away with the boy. My heart was racing and I was sweating profusely. As I waited for the police to arrive, they surrounded the building and rushed in by the dozen. I told them what room the man was in and gave them the key as well. They had me come up with them in case there was a problem gaining access to the room. I didn't really want to go up there myself, but if there was any chance they could help that boy, I was going to take it. The elevator ride seemed to last forever. As I thought out every possible scenario for what was about to go down, the elevator stopped. I and eight officers stepped off into the hallway, and we walked down towards the door. They had me wait closer to the end of the hall. I was terrified as I watched them knock on the door and demanded the man to come out. He refused and said he would kill the boy if they tried to get in. In that moment, things became very real. I believed him. They tried to negotiate with the man for almost an hour, but he was relentless and determined to stay in that room as long as possible. Finally, they decided to just blitz the room. It almost felt like everything was in slow motion. It was yelling, paired with the sounds of things crashing around the room. Before I knew it, they were walking out with the man in handcuffs. Behind them came another officer, running out with the boy in his arms. He could barely even hold his head up. He was put in an ambulance and rushed to the hospital. He made a full recovery and was reunited with his mother later that morning. 
The floor of the hotel had been closed off while they investigated. I learned later on that the man who was with the boy really was his father. Apparently, the wife was leaving him and taking their son because of his abusive tendencies. He'd taken the boy and threatened to hurt him if she left him. They had been on the run for over a month now. It also unfortunately turned out that the man was no stranger to abusing his son. The bruises were caused by him beating the little boy for daring to call up the front desk. I cried for days for that kid. I wanted so badly to take away his pain and make him forget what his own father had put him through. But I know that that's trauma that he'll have to live with forever. I'm just glad he got out of there alive and that his mom doesn't have to spend any more nights without her son. When I was 17, I got my first boyfriend named Alex. I'm a woman for reference. I used to hang out with him every Friday, and often on Saturdays too. His parents were super chill. They'd often work weekends, and he'd have the house all to himself. Sometimes his parents would be gone overnight, much to my delight. My parents knew I was staying over, and they didn't mind too much. They would never let him stay overnight at our house, though. I guess they didn't want certain activity going down under their bone roof, which I understood. One night, we had Alex's house all to ourselves. Alex ordered a pizza for us, and we were cuddling on the couch. The whole day, he'd been super flirty with me, and I was happy to finally be with him. We waited over an hour, though, and our pizza never arrived. I was really starving. So Alex called the pizza place and asked about our order. The person apologized and said the driver was on his way. They apologized again for any inconvenience. Alex got on the couch with me and we both kind of just whined about the late pizza. It finally arrived two hours later. At this point, I was well and truly hangry. Alex answered the door and I heard some commotion. I went into the hallway and I could hear Alex saying something about not giving someone a tip after they were rude. I locked eyes with the pizza guy at the door, and something about his appearance really just unnerved me. He looked to be in his later 20s, and he was scruffy. His demeanor changed from aggressive to surprised when he saw me, but Alex didn't seem to notice. He just said thanks for the food before shutting the door. I asked what happened, and Alex told me the pizza guy had dropped the bag with our pizza and drinks in it right on the ground. He then tutted when Alex picked it up and just kept glaring at him. Alex paid him, but the guy started demanding a tip. That was when Alex said no and told the man he was being so rude he didn't deserve one. I told Alex about the strange way that guy was looking at me, and it just seemed really creepy. Alex told me not to worry too much. Surely we wouldn't be seeing that guy again. We ate in the kitchen, and honestly, it left our minds rather quickly. After we had dinner, we went to his room, and we were planning on being intimate. We were kissing when I told Alex to make sure that he had locked the front door. He assured me he had, and I took his word for it. We were still kissing when I heard a car from outside. I pulled away and started freaking out, just in case it was Alex's parents. I didn't want them coming back and walking in on us doing the deed. Alex went over to the window, but said that he didn't see anything out there. Well, it felt like every time things were about to escalate, we would hear a weird noise that forced us apart. A second interruption occurred and sounded like someone kicking gravel or stones outside Alex's window. We both heard it, and again Alex looked out but saw nothing. The third interruption was bright car lights shining in through the window. This time we both looked outside, but we still could not find anything out there. When the fourth interruption happened, I actually groaned in frustration. I was so sexually frustrated it was almost painful. I got up and threw Alex's t-shirt on because it was long on me. Then I angrily stormed downstairs. Alex followed behind, but I ignored him. It sounded like someone was pounding on the front door. I went straight to it, unlocking it and about to unleash my full rage. 
When I opened it, to my horror, it was the pizza guy from before. He was standing away from the front door, just idling in the driveway. He was staring at me. It was like he had pounded on the door and then ran backwards to stand in the driveway. Alex came up behind me, and when he saw the pizza guy, he nudged past me and started screaming at him. You know, what the fuck was he doing and why was he still there? The guy just stood there staring at me. I could feel his eyes running up and down my bare legs, and I suddenly felt very uncomfortable. Alex noticed this, and his anger then grew tenfold. He told the pizza guy that he was calling the cops, and he better get off his property or he'd be in big trouble. The guy just continued to stand there, and that's when I had an idea. I told Alex to go grab his dad's gun. The second I said that, the guy snapped and suddenly took off running along the street. We witnessed him jump into his car and then speed off. Alex's dad didn't actually have a gun, but my quick thinking worked, thankfully. Alex slammed a door shut, and we made sure everything was locked up tight. We then called the police and Alex's parents. When the police came, they were utterly useless, though. They told us they'd speak to the restaurant as well as the dude himself, but that he hadn't actually done anything wrong. Alex's parents were on a weekend trip. They wanted to come back then and there, but he persuaded them to wait until the morning. They insisted on cutting their trip short, though, so they were back the very next morning. As you can imagine, that night, the intimate mood was completely ruined. We stayed up for a long time. I managed to doze off, but I don't think he did, because when I woke up, he looked completely exhausted. He reassured me that he'd slept a little bit, but I think he lied to spare me from worrying about him. We found out the pizza guy was fired, too. And that was the last we heard of it. We never ordered a pizza from that place ever again after. Alex would cook for me, or we'd cook something together. We were convinced the pizza guy was going to come back one day. That might sound extreme, but we really wondered if he was bothering other customers the same way he did us and if that was why he was late delivering our food. We'll never know for sure. I'm so glad Alex locked the front door. If he hadn't, maybe that creep would have just let himself in and done God knows what to us. I wonder if he was messing with us out of rage, or maybe he was just a pervert trying to creep on two teenagers. Either way, I'm glad Alex and I protected each other that night. I was 18 and in college, living with my boyfriend in our first apartment. He had left for an early class, and I myself had the day off, so I was taking the opportunity to sleep in a bit. I awoke suddenly, though, to a man I didn't know, sitting at the end of my bed staring at me. When he saw me wake up, he whispered into my ear, It's time to get up now. He just kept looking at me. I was trying to figure out if I was actually awake or if I was dreaming, if there was anything I could do to avoid getting raped and murdered by this stranger. He just kept sitting there, staring at me as if I was some curious creature. I figured out I must surely be awake. I also remembered I had been sleeping naked, so I didn't want to get up unless he made a move. After what felt like a lifetime of silence, he did it again. It's time to get up now. I said okay, still too shocked and scared to figure out what I could do. I didn't ask him who he was or tell him to leave or start screaming for help. He got up and simply walked out of the room, and then I heard voices in my kitchen. He left my bedroom door open when he left, so I still didn't want to get up yet because of the whole naked thing. After a few minutes, I built up the courage to wrap a blanket around myself grab some clothes, and dash to the bathroom. As I passed by the door, I saw him standing in the kitchen doorway, just staring into my room, watching me run for the bathroom. I got dressed and began to quickly make my way towards my cell phone. I had to pass him and my kitchen, where I could hear three male voices in there. As I passed by, I saw that two of the men were in plumber's outfits, and half of my kitchen was soaking wet. It turns out my upstairs neighbor had a burst pipe, and these men were here to fix it. 
they needed access to the problem pipe through my ceiling. The man sitting on my bed was with the realty company and had let them in. He says they knocked but I never heard it and no one had called either myself or my boyfriend to say they were coming over. I have no idea why this random guy thought it was okay or appropriate to wake me up while I was naked by staring at me while I was sleeping. He also didn't feel the need to explain who he was or what was going on. Needless to say, we broke our lease and found somewhere else to live after that. <laughs>